you looking for affordable? Well, we got it right here, the Toyota Yaris IA. There's a sedan, there's a hatchback. I'm gonna cover the pros and cons, so get yourself ready. Now you just saw a bit of the exterior footage of the Yaris sedan, and I'm going to expand on that a bit, which I don't typically do. When I first saw this vehicle, physically, when it was the Scion IA, I thought it looks like a giant bunion on wheels. It is The design in the sedan form is so awkward. However, they do have a hatchback version of this now, which looks far more natural. So you do have those two options. Let's talk about price. The sedan is one of the cheapest cars in America right now. Starts around $15,500. With the XSE trim, it's pushing $18,000. Now the hatchback is a little bit more. Now the lower trims of the sedan get a manual trans. The upper trim, you only get an automatic. And all the hatchbacks are automatic only, so that might be a big letdown for some people. Now, the last note about the exterior is I feel like, I know this was an experiment. It's kind of a courtesy to have an, an affordable car in the market because these don't exist. I feel like they could put just a little bit more energy and character into the exterior styling and it would make a huge difference, but whatever. Interior space, this is where you're gonna live. Let's talk about that. Now I just got out of a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of luxury cars where I couldn't figure out how to use basic features or functions, like changing the track of a song. And this is one of the most interesting parts about modern car design. And the Yaris, while it's trying to be completely simple, this is one of the best designs you can possibly get into. Everything that is here has always worked and will continue to work. Your knee area is padded and your heating and air conditioning dials, the rotary knobs, you, you can feel what the setting is. You can know where it is just by feel and not even having to look at it. Your shifter is traditional forward to park, back to drive. You have a manual parking brake, and even the infotainment, even though it's a generation old, in fairness to them, there's no graphics, there's no animations, and you look at the screen, you know what it is, you know where you're at, and you can easily turn it off if you need to. And then you have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in here, and that's what most people are gonna use and never really interact with that. And I think as a whole, this is a super comfortable space. The seating surfaces or the seats are also a highlight in here. It's very, very comfortable. Now the negative attributes, this is a very small cabin in terms of hip room, shoulder room, and there, there's just not a lot of room to grow in here that way. If you're a bigger person, if you're a wider person, you're gonna feel suffocated in here, and it definitely is a problem. This model, which is a higher trim level, does not have an armrest, and I feel like that's where they've done some of the cost cutting is taking out simple things like that, but this is a small car. There is no way around it. The design of it is designed to be smaller and it's not gonna be for everyone in that regard. Back seats are tiny, but they have the same plushy and comfort seats as in the front. The trunk is adequate and the hatch makes this a lot more usable. But let's put this on the lift and take a look at the underbody. Underneath the Toyota Yaris, whether you choose the sedan or the hatchback, it is made by Mazda in their Salamanca, Mexico plant. This and certain Mazda 3s are made there. Now, Toyota has collaborated with Mazda on this project to bring a more affordable car to North America without having to import one. And this was an important relationship. Toyota initially oversaw a lot of the quality there to make sure that this was up to their standards. And when you look at the underneath, at least, it's very, very simple, but it's pretty clean for the price range. There's a lot of plastic paneling here to smooth out airflow for NVH. And the good thing is you see a lot of under, underbody sealers and coatings on it. It's not just raw steel or raw metal exposed to the elements like we saw in the Chevy Equinox, which is a lot more expensive than this. So there is some effort there. That's not to say that you're gonna have corrosion or rust on this, but you can see that even though it's cheap, it's not horrible looking in some spots. 
strut front, very basic. Uh, the rear end has a torsion beam. It does not have independent rear suspension. And I'll talk about a little bit of the ride on the drive, but needless to say, because this is such a small lightweight vehicle, they don't need a lot here to keep things under control. And it also helps to reduce cost for the buyer. Now, everything else looks like what you saw in some of the previous generation Mazdas. That's because this is a Mazda 2 underneath. And they do not sell the Mazda 2 in the United States because Toyota and Mazda have an agreement that this will become the Mazda 2. So this is the main reason also why Toyota and Mazda have entered into a joint venture to build a factory in the United States to co-build a new vehicle or vehicles. But that's enough. That's really all you need to know. Let's get this on the road and see how it drives. Setting off in the Yaris IA. So to be completely fair, you have to look at this for exactly what it is. A subcompact car that has been outsourced to be made at a low cost. It is built on a previous generation architecture and to me what this feels like is a Mazda 2 and that's exactly what it is. And if you've never driven a Mazda 2, think about the previous generation Mazda 3 and then cut out a lot of the refinement there. So you're going to ask yourself if this thing feels so old, why would you even consider it? And to me, this is an important car. Cars like this need to exist, much like the Kia Rio or the Hyundai Accent. This serves as one of the lowest cost options in the United States to, to get into a new car. So when you drive this, and I, I just went off kind of on some of these luxury cars, I've driven the modern luxury cars that are so overcomplicated, that have so many things on them, They've stripped out every single thing about a driving experience. And this kind of is a throwback. So it is noisy. There is a lot of wind noise. You hear it through the glass. You feel it through the cabin. There's not a ton of sound insulation. You hear it from the engine when you get this thing off the, off the line. This 1.5 liter, when you rev it, you feel it. <laughs> You feel it, you hear it, there's vibration, there's vibration in the steering wheel, just subtle vibrations that let you know you're still driving the car. And to me, that's why it's refreshing. Now I know that most customers or buyers think that this is a bad thing, but I would say if you're, if you're looking for something that is a little bit more affordable, that doesn't completely overwhelm you with a ton of gimmicks, electronics, your, your steering wheel's not getting tugged on. You don't hear a million beeps and warnings about every time you start to let go of the steering wheel. This is as simple as it gets in the modern era of driving. And I know that's not by design. It's completely by cost cutting and the, the concept of trying to make it more affordable for certain consumers. Now, in terms of ride quality, comfort, and all of that, that's where this is great. The seats are one of the best parts. They are super comfortable. They're super soft, although they're narrow, like we talked about in the interior commentary. The transmission performance is pretty good. It's quick. If you turn off traction control and you go into manual mode, it holds revs. It, auto, it rev matches downshift. So you still have that aspect. There is a little bit of fun to drive that is from the Mazda engineering team. Now, the last thing is ride quality ride quality is pretty good in here. Despite it being a bit noisier, it's it's not a beat you up ride. It kind of surprises you at its nimbleness and some of that again is, well, it's lightweight, of course, which helps a lot. And then you can kind of, there's enough body roll, but not a ton where you could have a little bit more fun driving this. And, you know, I say that this is not a sporty car, but because of its smaller dimensions, it makes you feel like you can get away with a lot more. But I'm gonna leave it at that. Truthfully, there's not much more to say about the driving experience that I haven't already talked about with the previous Scion IA. Take this for a drive if you're looking for a lighter compact car 
but I'm gonna get into the final thoughts and talk about the pros and the cons. Final thoughts on the Toyota Yaris. I'm gonna get into the pros and the cons. The cons are this, the exterior. It doesn't look good. And it's like Toyota and Mazda got together and said, we have X amount of dollars to work. What do we do with the front and the back? Uh, well, can't do much. So let's just slap a new bumper on. It's not a cohesive car. It's not fun looking. It's not youthful enough to be like, oh, I want that and I want to look back at it. You certainly never want to look at this thing. The other part is the paint quality. When you look at the lower half of the car from like here down, it's like they decide, well, you know, we don't want to retune our robots to have a smooth paint job and get, get, get the paint finished smooth. So what it looks like is a Mako paint job from like here down. There's so much orange peel. It, it just looks really bad. It's not something you typically see on a modern car, but again, they have to cut costs somewhere and the quality suffers there. And anyway, the cons are exterior. Now, the biggest pro is the interior space. This is an amazing interior. It's so simple. Every, everything functions well. The seats are comfortable and it puts certain cars that are like twice the price to shame because they didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Now the negative part with this being a subcompact is it's really tight if you're a bigger person. If you're wider, if you put on an excessive number of pounds, you're not gonna be happy on the inside. You get the hatch if you need a little bit more usability, but I think a car like the Kia Rio hatch, while it doesn't have as nice of an interior, it's far more usable than this. And it's just a side effect of this architecture. Now, drivability is strong. You have an automatic trans and a manual trans, no CVT here. The automatic works well. You can manually control it well. The manual trans feels good if you get the lower trim level and the drivability is good without putting you to sleep. However, it is a noisier ride. It's got a lot of wind noise and there's more vibration through this car than what you would get from something like a Civic or a Corolla. But again, you have to factor all this in. Do you go used or do you want a car with a warranty and a lower interest rate? And that's where this comes in. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.